So, James, I wanted to start by asking you, um, not about, just about... About Brexit, is it? About, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well... You can if you like. Yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just about your career, but we spoke about it upstairs briefly. It's about um, the emerging players, and you said that there's a culture of being sensitised. Um, what effect do you think it has on future players in the game at large when up-and-coming players become sensitised in the kind of culture of them being themselves and the personality they're allowed to grow? Um, I always think, you know, especially in this country, uh, personality in sport is kind of something that people want, but actually don't actively encourage. I think, you know, um, you know, we have a very ruthless media uh, and I think that, especially in rugby, um, you kind of almost have to be, uh, you know, when I first started, it was very much about being very humble, very quiet, um, don't put your head above the, the parapet, earn your spurs. Um, the media was somebody, you know, people to be feared um, and, you know, you weren't to do anything outside of rugby. If you had a character, then you were obviously, can I swear, a dickhead? We're all, you know, so, um, and, and all, these kind of, all those kind of stuff. And I think that uh, players now, you know, in my, my kind of generation when we came through, I was kind of the first academy player or, the, uh, you know, uh, out of that kind of mix. But I still was interacting with players who had known amateur rugby, so they had jobs, they'd had everything. So they kind of were a bit worldly wise, they had real character. Now, you know, you look at it and the players are coming off, you know, they've been picked up way earlier, kind of 14, 15 years old. All they've known is, is, is rugby. Um, you know, the media's, um, you know, become, I think, more ruthless. If you saw in kind of 2011, 2015, I don't think we've got into the same territory as, as football players, but there's a lot more scrutiny. I think social media um, has kind of taken things to a new level. I think mobile phones have, you know, turned everyone into a paparazzi. So you've got all those kind of things into a melting pot uh, where players, you know, are actively, not actively encouraged to be themselves or to, to have personality. Every time you do, you know, a photo shoot or a video with someone, you know, you've got to be so careful what you say. They're going to cut anything else that's really interesting. So if you ever watch anything now, it's like, yeah, no, you know, I, I, like, I eat a lot of protein. I have a lot, you know, I, I eat a lot of chicken and, you know, you know, what do you think about this? And, oh, let me draw a picture of my teammate. And that's as exciting as risque as it gets. You know, or like, what do you do on your day off? Oh, I go for coffee with the lads. You know, it's just like, it's just what it, it's what it is. And then, you know, you say something funny, they're like, no, can't put that in there, can't do that in there. And I think that's kind of a, almost an indictment of where the rest of the world's going now. You know, we talk about like, the, the snowflakes and people. You can offend anybody doing anything now. And I think sometimes you've got to you know, stick to your convictions and realise that people are going to get upset doing anything and everyone's got an opinion now and the problem is it's one click away. So... I've tried to make sure that I've always retained my kind of personality, my enjoyment, because I think you only get one shot at life. I might be completely wrong. I might come back as an earwig. I don't know, but I don't, I don't, I don't think so. You know, I think this is not a dress rehearsal. So, so you've got one opportunity. I'm, I've made the most of my limited skill in rugby. I've, you know, had some amazing adventures. I've had some journeys. I've put my foot in it. I've done, I've done stuff. I'm, I'm like Marmite. You either love me or you hate me. There's a queue around the corner of people that hate me just as long as the people who like me. Um, but I've enjoyed myself and I've made the most of it and that's kind of the way I want to, want to be, really. Uh, and, I, and I think people often apologise now for, for too much stuff and I think having a personality in sport is a really, really important thing. So you've certainly, you've certainly done that, especially with your social media. Do you feel as though the culture's changing or do you feel as though you're pushing against a tide that you can't really beat? Um, I think it is, you know what, I think there are boys now doing a bit more. They realise they've got a bit more freedom. <clears throat> but, you know, I also think there's, a, there's a, another set of people who are, who are almost making a rob to their own back. You know, I don't know why people would go on the piss and film it and, and put stuff up there. Or, or, or a lot of people, I don't know why you want to film everything. Like, I film lots of things. But like, there's even, even there's some stuff I don't want to put up there. Do you know what I mean? I just think that... You know, you need to have a smartness with, with what you're doing. And, you know, I'm very calculating in what I post and what I don't post. And I'm aware of it. And I'd, sometimes I say stuff just because, it, you know, I know it's going to be quite funny. Or I, post, I posted something the other day that I, I you know, I thought about it about five or ten minutes. And it was um, about Prince Philip and the, the car accident thing. It was on my Instagram. It was like a, and it said dash cam footage from inside the car. And it was a corgi driving the car. And I was like... This is like actual comedy genius. Like I, I, I love this. Like it, it's, it's, it's good. But I, you know, I posted it. My missus like, why, you know, why have you posted that? And I was like, because oh. it was funny. And I think, <laughs> and I think, unfortunately, the only people in this country who are really can do whatever they want are professional comedians. 
and I'm sadly how much I like to try, pretend I'm not a professional comedian. So I, I have responsibility um, to, to do things, but I think boys are slowly doing that. You'll see that they're, they're branching out and they do, they do bits and pieces. Um, but I still think they're not encouraged to. And I still think that anything you see coming from, you know, say the England squad or coming from from club stuff is is very you know sanitised. Like I think, but Bristol Bears have probably got the best social media stuff that they've done um, because they just put it out there. They make create entertaining stuff. They know some people are going to be really upset, and there's a lot of old you know angry old rugby people like Whoa, you know I get it all the time. Some bloke commented on my my. Um, uh, the, England did a video of me talking about all the different things I do off, off the field and someone wrote underneath it saying, if James Haskell spent less time worrying about diggers, <laughs> less time worrying about diggers and less time focusing on his wife, he'd probably make it back into the England team. And I was like, oh, I knew diggers were going to be the downfall of it and my, <laughs> and sod the wife, like obviously what an idiot. Um, so, so you're always going to get people to get real rattled about whatever you, whatever you do, but I think you've got to stand by your convictions and and have character and, and leverage off what you're doing. Um, but, but try to be sensible, but remember that people get the knickers in a twist about everything. And then or it's 2019s and their boxer shorts in a twist. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> then how important is it for you to have other stuff outside of rugby as well? Obviously you've been one of the leading figures in actually establishing yourself as a brand and all that. How important is it for other rugby players coming through to do similar things? Well, firstly, the brand thing is like, it's like a bone of contention with me because um, <clears throat> it was made it was said by an old coach of mine when, when they wanted to sign me for, the, for, for WAS and they tried to pay me peanuts and bully me into signing it. And when I decided not to and wanted to go to, to, to France, they came out with a line that, um, you know, uh, Brand Haskell prefers to do this stuff and everybody's role with it. Loads of people have gone it. So I never referred to myself as a brand. I never referred to myself in the third person, let alone, or if I have, it's been tongue in cheek. Um, and he, uh, and, and he you know, so he kind of ran away with it. The, all I've ever done and I think this works in most areas of life, is that you can either have a job, right, in life, so you can either turn up, get your paycheck and leave, or you can be massively invested in what you do and make a career out of it. You know, something that you're unbelievably passionate about. And I think that rugby for me was, was a career choice that I wanted. I did everything I could do to live and breathe it. I, I've always gone and seen extra nutritionists, extra trainers. You know, I've trained on holiday. I've, you know, I've been out on the smash and trained the next, the next day in, just because I wanted to get the demons out, and you know, I've, I've tried. You know, even on Saturday, I was down in, in Bath and I had an opening of my gym, but I had a running session to do. So, me and my missus went to the university. Like, you know, I'm not sure I was even allowed to use the ground, but you know, kind of parked the car up down a country lane, climbed over a wall, did, doing doing fitness laps on the field while university students are playing, kind of kind of playing football. My missus is sitting on a t-shirt, timing me. I'm doing it. It's a bit weird, but you got to you got to get the, you got to get the work done. And I think that. That's great, but it doesn't last forever, and especially in a game that you know uh, revolves around the ability of your body to to perform. You know, you have to have things outside of rugby, and I think that I, I was there when Matt Hampson broke his neck um, and never, you know, never walked again. He's been incredible in what he's achieved with setting up his you know get busy living centre and you know how he's made the, the, the most of, of his life and kind of achieved more than I think he could ever have, have dreamed of. Um, but from that day, I've always prepared for the day I was going to retire. And I think being a rugby player, being in the public eye, you're presented with opportunities. And I'm very passionate about rugby, but I'm, I'm passionate about wanting to be successful. And I think if you have a nine to five job and you're not that motivated by it and you don't like it, then you need to find something else because it actually helps you get life balance. Like for example, if I was a rugby player and all I ever did was rugby and I lived and I, uh, you know, I lived and breathed it 24 seven, I'd live and breathe the highs and lows of it all the time. So when you have a good game, life would be brilliant. When you have a bad game, everything would be you know, terrible. If you get injured, then what do you do? Once if you have to retire, you've got nothing else. So with being kind of what I've done, I've always tried to make sure that you know, when I'm injured, I've got other things to focus on. And actually, it means that I spend more focus on my rugby because you know, I, I, I go right in the morning, I go, so I'm up at seven in the morning, I'm into training at 8.30, you know, I, I'm, I'm there all day until four o'clock. I tick every single box that I need to do, do my extras, you know, whether that's fitness, diet, training, mobility, physio, and then my work day starts after that. And I know when I go home, I can put rugby to one side because I've done nothing more, you know, got nothing more to talk about. And I can, you know, work, I'm launching a, ra a house music radio show. I can work on that. Or I can do all this F45 gym stuff or, you know, write a cookbook, whatever it might be that I was doing at that particular time. And I actually find it, 
it makes you feel like you're achieving stuff and you've got a good work-life balance. And it's and it's and it's it's important to have that because a lot of people don't aren't always interested, they're not always lucky enough to do what they want to do. You know, and, and anyone who's ever been really rich and successful never started out to be rich and successful. They start out because they had a real passion. A lot of people don't know their passion. A lot of people don't know what they want to do. You know, they always, you know, there's always a lot of responsibility to say, what do you want to do? I had no idea what I wanted to do. I never wanted to be a rugby player, but I kind of gave it an opportunity, gave it a chance for a year, and I'm still doing it 17 and a half seasons later. But within that, I wanted to make sure that I, I um, always maximised every opportunity I had to kind of develop myself. And I think now doing stuff off the field is a really good balance. And, it, and, it, and it's so eclectic. The only problem is I should probably you know, focus more on one particular thing. I mean, it's, it's better to do kind of two things really well than 10 things kind of badly. And I, I'm like a workaholic, so I'm like driving a digger on a Monday, I'm like DJing on a Tuesday, I write a book, a book on, a, on, on a Wednesday, you know, you know doing you know, after dinner or corporate work on a, you know, another day, Thursday. So it's, um, it's good though. It does make me feel like I, I've got a balance. I know that hopefully when my career finishes, I'll be able to transition out of that. It doesn't take away from the fact that no doubt I'll be, you know, I'll struggle a little bit because I think people always struggle when they've done something for such a long period of time and they have to have that kind of transition. But actually, I think it's really important to have a hobby and it's so easy now. Anyone can set up a business. You can, have a, you can set up a limited company in two minutes and you can set up a website in, in you know, a couple of days and be selling or working or writing or blogging. And I recommend to anyone, if you've got an idea, and you're really passionate about it, do it even if you were studying, because it gives you some other balance, because when you're sick of doing what you're doing, you can just go back and do that. And it's fun and exciting, it's passionate, and, you're, and you're, you'll enjoy yourself. So then what boxes do you feel as though you still have to tick before your career's up? <clears throat> and then what do you want to, any out of, the, kind of out of the way boxes that you want to move into afterwards? Um, I would love to play for the Barbarians. I've never done that. Um, obviously, I'd like to win a World Cup um, and, and, or, you know, and, and kind of go to a third World Cup. You know, that's kind of quite a long shot. I'm, I'm sort of quite far down the pecking order. Obviously, not playing for for eight weeks and other guys going kind of well. Um, that's you know, it's always kind of be a uh, a long a long haul to get there. Um, I think I think you know, I'd love to win a, a, a trophy with Northampton. You know, whether it's the um, the Champions Cup or the uh, you know that. I don't know, whatever this obscure Premiership tournament is I'm playing in this Saturday. You know, I don't, like, you don't know the names. There's so many things. Like, um, so I think to, to win some silverware would be great. Um, and I just think, yeah, I'd like to keep playing in, until I know that I could play to the level I want to play. And only you know that is when you run out to the training field, you run out to a game, you know you can't do that. Then I'll call it, then I'll call it a day. And I think I'd like to move into... You know, I'd like to do a lot more TV and, and, and kind of pre um, presenting work. I think I'd really enjoy that. Uh, you know, the, and then I'd like to do a lot more DJing. I know people kind of kind of snigger a little bit about the DJing stuff, but it's it's a real passion of mine. I absolutely love it. I was very late to music. I think you know my first CD I bought when I was like 15. I didn't really know a lot about stuff, but I, you know, I started going to Ibiza, started going to Vegas, and I always use music as a tool pre-game. So you know my the sports psychologist who I started uh, seeing when I was 17, you know, said, listen, we need to get consistent performance from you. Like, how do we, how do we do that? And she said, how do you prepare for a game? And I was like, well, sometimes I do this, sometimes I do that. And she goes, we need consistency. So should I be, ever listen to music? Uh, and I was like, oh, not really, I'm not massively into music. And she goes, well, you need to kind of um, find some music that's really emotive, that makes you feel a million dollars. Like you've all got that tune, like you go on a night out, you're like, you know, by the bar and you hear it, you're like, oh my God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get over there. Or you're sitting in a room, you're having a bad, you know, you've had a fight with your, your you know, your, your partner, and a tune comes on. It's like Magic FM. You're like, ah, full depression mode. Or something comes on. You're like, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, forget her. I'm unbelievable. Or you know what I mean. Whatever it might be. Um, and uh, I, I, so I, I kind of had created a playlist, and I, and I used to listen to it before a game. When I started to go to Ibiza and Vegas, you obviously walk walk out there, you know sun shining, there's someone standing at the front kind of DJing, controlling the whole evening. You know, he doesn't have to be musically talented, he's not playing a, 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 an instrument, but he's controlling the whole thing, or he, she's controlling the whole kind of atmosphere. And I thought, hold on a minute, I love music, I love attention, why would I not want to <laughs> get involved in that bandwagon? So, so I went and did the DJ course, and, and um, I lucky enough, my first kind of gig was um, Minister of Sound. And the last thing I did, I've done about 30 of them, the last thing I did was for the Young Farmers Federation. 
and I got invited down to Blackpool to, to do this. And my agent, uh, I got like a DJ agent, and he said, uh, look, we're gonna book you for this, really big gig, if it goes well, that they want you back. And I wasn't really paying attention, because the problem is, while you're being a rugby player, being a DJ is not a very good, it's not conducive to being a professional sportsman, you know, kind of one, two in the morning, late, late night, you can't really do it. I turn a lot of stuff down. But anyway, this was in the off season, so I drove to, down to Blackpool, and I got there, and you ordinarily, when you ask about being a DJ, you say, oh, uh, who's on before me? Because you've got someone playing like, you know, reggae or, or, or soul funk, and you're coming in with like hard techno, it's not gonna really merge, so you're gonna gotta know what you're, you're following. And I said, who am I, fo- who am I coming on after? And they went, oh, we're uh, a band. So that's easy, they're just, you know, I think they were like the Wurzels or something, you know what I mean, singing about Combine Harvesters, it was gonna be easy. And I said, oh, who's on after me? Because there's normally, normally when I've done stuff, um, I think you all probably know what Game of Thrones, Hodor. Hodor does something called Rave of Thrones, and he's uh, an unbelievable DJ. And normally I've done a few things where I've like, f- he's followed me as like the main, main attraction. So I said, oh, who's on after me? And they went, no, no, you're, you're it. I said, what do you mean I'm it? So you're the main, the headline. I was like, okay, well, this is a bit weird. I said, well, how many people are gonna be here? And they went 4,000. And I was like, Right, I just need to have a minute. Like, so I said to my wife, I said, right, we just, I just need to get have a minute. So I said, right, hold on a minute. I, I don't know what I've got myself into. I'm headlining for these people. There's 4,000 people. And I said, well, it's not 4,000 people in this room. And they're like, yeah, there'll be 4,000 people in this like giant winter garden or whatever it was. So I went out on, I went out and um, luckily it all went real well and, and kind of, um, you know, smashed it and had a great, they had a great time. So much so that actually they, they banned it ever happening again in Blackpool because everyone like basically had a riot outside, not because of my music. <laughs> That was the best bit, like the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail kind of put an article like, oh, young, you know, rich, posh farmers um, destroy Blackpool. Uh, and one of the acts was me. And I was like, how have I been associated with that? <laughs> like, I didn't do anything. Um, so they had a great time. But actually, that, that was for me was the, the closest I've got to playing. And cl- my wife said to me, oh, you, you, um, I've never seen you so happy. And for me, I want to do much more DJing than anything else because I think it's going to be a nice transition. Because imagine, you know, you run, it, run out in front of 86,000 people, every week you're performing, and suddenly like that, you're not. And suddenly no one cares who you are, what you're doing, uh, you don't have that kind of thing, you haven't got any teammates around you, but actually, I think DJing, going out performing, having that nerves, watching people, you know, interact with you and having to perform, I think for me is gonna be a real nice thing. I don't, I don't know how long it'll last, but I think if I could do, you know, if I could do two speaking gigs a month, you know, two DJ gigs a month and do a presenting job or, do stuff around my, my health and fitness, that would, be, that would be the ideal bits to achieve outside of that, you know, once I've finished with rugby, whether that's next week or, or you know, next year. <laughs> Why don't we open up, up to the floor now? Uh, so if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. Uh, we'll get a microphone to you. Hi, James. Um, I don't think I need it, to be honest. Um, uh, you've tapped out of 80 caps or so at the moment. Um, and obviously you've come from Wasp, you've moved to Northampton, you've got a very expansive playing career. Is there, who's been the best leader you've ever worked under and why? You can say yourself if you want to be a dick. (laughs) (laughs) Want me talking to myself in the mirror the whole time? You are the best. Um, I would say, it pains me to say it, because he threw me under the bus a little while ago, but um, I think Lawrence Dalio, just in terms of, uh, he was someone that uh, commanded a lot of respect. You know, he has that kind of presence, that dominance, that big neck, oh, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, that kind of, you know, I used to get into him a little bit because every time the red light on the camera came on during the anthems, he'd instantly start crying. And I was like, come on, mate, come on. Um, but he, in terms of the way he spoke, really well, very articulate, extremely motivating. And then he always backed it up with the way he played. And, you know, I don't think, Leaders don't necessarily need to have Churchillian speeches. They don't need to be screamers and shouters. They need to have empathy to the team around them. And I think, you know, he always, um, you know, got the right button. There's a few, you know, cliche things like, you know, it's going to be a street fight without any tools, bring your tools, you know, let's bar up and stuff. There's a few funny kind of lines in there, but actually, genuinely, it was, he, was, he was the most inspirational. I didn't get to ever kind of play with Martin Johnson. I had, had, had him as... Um, a coach with England, he was obviously someone that, again, commanded massive presence. I would have liked to see what he was like on the field. Um, Sergio Parise was, was, was good, mainly because he led by example, but he was very laid back about what he, what he did. But I'd say, yeah, I'd say Lawrence is the best captain I've ever worked with. And actually, I, I'm actually saying that, I think Dylan Hartley as well, because Dylan, not necessarily for 
um, you know, like incredible speeches, but actually for someone that understands uh, what's required, works incredibly hard at the job, um, sets great standards, uh, motivates those around him, works harder, you know, he, or, you, know, uh, you know, Eddie makes him work harder, but he works harder off his own back than, any, than anyone else. So I think h him in a, in a different way, but, but again, it, they're two different things. They kind of prove my point. You know, Lawrence is the great, the great orator. You know, Dylan is the kind of the great, you know, um, motivator and leader. And he's happy to call people out and set standards, which is very hard these days. To, to actually confront someone and say, like me standing in front of you and going, actually, I don't think you, what you did is right. Stand up the front. You haven't done this. You haven't done that. We've got standards. If you don't like it, you can, you can f off. And and. And that, and that, and that, you know, and that, and that makes, you know, he did it to me first day at Saints. We were sitting there, like, I think it was like first week, and and I've been talking to him literally 30 seconds before having a, a talk with him, and he stood up, and he went, right, who's parked, uh, who's parked a Range Rover over this line? And, I, and I'm looking around, going, oh god, it's me. And they've gone, you're not allowed to park here. Boom, you have to buy a crate of piss for the lads. Um, you know, go buy a load of beers. It's not acceptable. We don't do that. And I'm like. Oh. I was just talking to you. You could have given me a heads up. Um, but I like that because nobody's, nobody's above the law, nobody's impervious. And uh, that's what I liked about Wasps back in the day as well. You know, even Lawrence was top of the tree, but even he got, got stick. And I think that's important. You, you need to be able to have, be level headed and kept on, your, kept on your toes. Take another question. Yeah, um, You worked out in New Zealand um, for a year or so. Um, what do you think was the standout? difference between working in Britain and working out in New Zealand or Europe, I said. Also, with the youth system just churning out unbelievable players with such consistency. Yeah, I think, you know, New Zealand was really interesting for me because I um, grew up watching, you know, when, when Sky actually had some rugby highlights, um, watching, you know, super, uh, you know, super 12, Super 10, you know, watching the Blues play, uh, the Crusaders play, you know, Carlos Spencer, um, you know, Doug Howlett, all these kind of guys doing like, incredible stuff. You know, uh, Penny Thalthaus, you know, just doing stuff that you couldn't dream of, players offloading, you know, kicking the ball. So I thought, look, I wanted to go and see what that was like. And were they playing this, like, incredible rugby that no one of us could understand? Because if you listen to any commentators now, anyone from New Zealand is instantly better than anyone else. But even, like, when it comes to coaches and players, like, they're, they're afforded this kind of aura. Oh, you played New Zealand? Oh, you must be, you must be unbelievable. Uh, and, and I found that sometimes that just not to be the case. But obviously, they are number one team in the world. And I found over there that rugby is rugby wherever you go. And that uh, what was different over in New Zealand more so than anything else, I think, was everybody wants to be and all black like they are the footballer equivalent football equi footballers equivalent to you know over uh, over here you know everybody wants to do that if you play any other sport no one cares you know the whole system is 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 built up around that they are very um naturally you know gifted kind of athletes and you've got kind of a small pool but it's such a compressed pool, it's such a condensed pool where everyone wants to do that and i found that uh you know playing over there they were probably smaller than 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 we are but you know, athletically very, <coughs> very powerful. You know, when they, when you made a break in, in kind of the, the, the Super 15, more often than not, you would finish that, finish that break. You know, people wanted to pick up a ball all the time. Over here, the first kind of thing is to pick up a weight. You know, or, or you know, they wanted to pick up a ball. They play touch all, all the time. Um, you know, their, their club rugby is, is stronger than our club rugby over here. You know, if you don't play for the Super 15 side, you'll end up being, um, you know, go back playing for your local club. So, you know, you could be, a, a normal rugby player suddenly playing against Mar Nonu or, or, or someone else like that. And I think that makes a, a massive difference. I think the surfaces are better over there consistently. I think, you, you know, you're playing, you know, Australia and South Africa, um, you know, moving around. I think the weather's better, encourages a better rugby. They've got no relegation, so they can come up with a game plan and a, and a style of play and they can stick to it and they can develop it because they've got no fear about um, it kind of... Uh, you know, falling apart and getting relegated. You know, everyone wants to start the season in the Premiership with an unbelievable rugby. You know, come this time of the year when you're like, you know, at the bottom half of the table when it's pouring with rain, the pitches are terrible. You know, it's you've got to play rugby to win, and that's not always the same as playing to perform. Um, and I and I think youth system wise, they they've just got the fact that everybody wants to do it. Like I think if everybody wants to play, you know, rugby over here, how how much talent will be will be have? You know. Um, so I think that that's kind of what f for me makes a massive difference. I just think they're cons they're consistently well drilled and they just love to love to play. 
And I think when you've got that kind of mentality, it, it, it gets the best out of you. And for me, you know, they weren't invincible by any stretch of the imagination. And I thought that more often than not, you know, actually playing against the other New Zealand sides wasn't, you know, was physical, but probably, you know, similar to Premiership, probably, you know, actually less because defensively, whatever they say, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the same. Um, you know, Australian sides were actually probably not as tough as the, as the Premiership. And then the South African sides were, you know, as tough as a premiership or actually much more like a test match. Because that was a phase where they, <laughs> they used to have a guy stand next to a ruck and then the other bloke would hold him by the shorts and the collar and he used to throw in the ball and he used to just ram the other guy into, into you like a batting ram. And then you've got like someone like Vermeulen being rammed in by, you know, I mean, it sounds a bit odd, but by, um, <laughs> by you know, by, you know, Etzebeth or someone else like that, it makes, it's pretty horrific. And you just know that it's going to be like, if, you know, if you give them any kind of gain line. So that's, that for me, some of the worst I've ever felt after a game, having to, to deal with that. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully the rugby over here will keep, will keep improving and will compete because, you, know, you know, England almost beat them in the, in, in the autumn. But I think they've, they've definitely got it right. But it's not this magic that everyone will believe you. It's just some pretty simple fundamentals, I think, that, that, that we need over here. And then take another question. Can we, yeah, bring the microphone down to... More and more people retiring early due to head injuries. Do you think there's a way around that? Just your views in the matter. It's a very good question. I don't know. I, I find the, the concussion thing bizarre uh, purely because it's like in the last three, four years, either we were all like ignoring it and it wasn't happening or it literally is happening all the time now. And that's what I find kind of really um, bizarre. Like I don't remember many games, if ever, anyone getting knocked out and having to go off. Now, maybe they were getting knocked out and not saying anything. And I, you know, I can only remember two games in my, or three games in my career where I've seen someone get a head knock and they've turned up at a line out and they're like facing the wrong way and they don't know any of the calls. And they're like, ah, who are we playing? You're like, oh God, okay. So, uh, you know, I would always say to the physio, listen, this guy's like, brain's marmalade, like you need to get him off. <laughs> like he's gone, like, you, you know. Um, and I've only had one concussion, in, well, Obviously, there's like cerebral incidents. So I've probably had loads of them. You know, it's the same with NFL people. They reckon they get all the time rattling around in that helmet. Like I've got up sometimes and not been, I've not ever been knocked out. I got out to run that way and like run off to the left a little bit. And people are like get angry. Like, that, well, that's concussion. I was like, okay, well, I've had a few concussions then. Um, but the only time I ever got knocked out was my, my kind of big, big comeback. It was like, bam, down and out. 30 seconds later, uh, out. Like, like in the fetal position, which my wife mocked me on the internet um, quite badly about. <laughs> so it was like my big, yeah, and people were sending me messages going, oh mate, even I last longer than that. I was like, that's what your missus says. Um, <laughs> but I, I, think, I think the concussion thing's a real hard one. I think they, they changed the tackle laws. I, I th look, I've always won a scrum cap. I, I think it makes, for me, it makes a bit of a difference. Um, I think, you know, you could do a lot more on tackle, a lot more work on tackle technique at a younger age. I think would make it would make a difference. Uh, I just think you know the the monitoring and the medical side of the concussion stuff is improving all the time. Uh, I think there's a lot of pressures on pressure on clubs to to just like fix stuff and do stuff right, but it's very hard to track that. You know, you've got people with iPads watching stuff in the stands now. So as soon as something happens, someone has to rewind it and check. They're like, oh, he went out. Oh, is that a head injury? And they're trying their best, but it's a contact sport. And you could be like that mad politician woman who wants to like ban it. But it's like a contact sport. It's like, how do you make boxing safe? You can't. People are punching each other in the head. Like, <laughs> like I'm 120 kgs. I'm running at another bloke who's 120 kgs, and he has to stop me, and I have to run through him. Like, you can't, you know, you can't stop that. So I think you've just got to understand the risks you take. It, it, I just hope it doesn't go like, you know, uh, end up with the same problem they had in the NFL, you know, where people are getting real problems. But I think, you know, there's a lot of people retiring. I think a lot more will retire. I don't see a way of of stopping it because like you said even if you just bang your head doing something you can get you know like my side of my tongue's got numb before which was like this is weird <laughs> I don't know why this has happened um but like, it's a contact sport like, you're gonna get rattled so I, I think they're trying to do their best I would say the only thing I'd say is maybe more people wear scrum caps or maybe as a, as a kid try that but there's not much you can do I don't think at the moment a few neck curls as well yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that does, you know, they are starting to do a lot more neck stuff and everything else. But again, I just don't. The problem is, is that you've seen in boxing or anyone get knocked out 
anyway, you know, if you get hit on the button, you, you're gone. Doesn't matter what 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 happened. Like when I when I got knocked out, I mean, it was by, it was by Freddie Burns. Like I was like, this is my big moment. Like I ran out of line. I, I spotted him. I was like, oh, I'm gonna end you. <laughs> and uh, I ran up. And honestly, the, la- the ball came. He was up in the air like that. And the last minute, he saw me and he turned his hip. And my 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 temple hit his hip bone. I don't remember anything. But I'm, that's the first concussion I ever had. You know, one millimetre the other way. And I'm back, you know, but sadly I wasn't, I was off. <laughs> and didn't want to come down to the hand. Okay, um, I have to make a de- declaration in that I'm on the dark side. Um, ref, so asking the question, are there any referees out there who you really do admire and are there actually, you know, it's like, who you really enjoy playing under? Um, I love Nigel Owens. Um, Apart from Nigel. <laughs> I love Nigel Owens. I mean, I, I've always had... Um, I've never had a problem with referees. I mean, I am the most carded. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I am literally the most carded England international ever. That's like a terrible stat. That's going like, to be like my legacy. Um, they're all for different things, though, which is kind of my why one get out of jail free card. They weren't like consistently doing the same stupid thing. There's just a lot of stupid things. Um, no, but I remember, like, I, I remember Alan Rolands, for example, one of my yellow cards was that. Uh, the week before we were playing against Australia in the Autumn Internationals and the Australian scrum was absolute toilet at the time and every time we were hitting into it uh, their front row was just folding and a lot of referees don't referee that they see a scrum go down but they don't realise the guy's just hinging from his hips he's just putting his head down and we're f- the boys are falling it's so dangerous because the guys are slamming into the floor and I remember turning to Alan and I said and, and I think um, Dylan Hartley was, was, was a player hooker at that time. I said, but you've got a referee, he's dropping it, he's dropping it. And he said, you know, how about you do your job? I said, how about you do your job? Like, da, da. hated that, hated it. He was a guy that used to work at, walk into change rooms like with like a real tight, 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 tight lycra. And he'd be like, I don't know, you've been doing, your, doing a few curls? He'd be like, yeah, I have actually. He'd be like, <laughs> so you like, obviously try and win him over. And, and I, said, I remember saying that to him. And obviously you shouldn't talk to the touch judge, so I, you know, I'm probably at fault there. But the next week, I didn't realise that he was then refereeing me against New Zealand. And it's like a rolling mall, and I run into the mall, and, and I hit someone with my shoulder, and he's like, boom, yellow card, and I can see him just looking at me. And he's like, oh, he got his revenge. You know I mean, the dish best served cold, he waited and waited and waited, and then and absolutely did me. So um, that's one yellow card we can wipe off as not being a good one. But I think, um, yeah, I think I like Nigel, because I like, I like, pers- you know, like his personality, I think it's quite funny. Uh, and he's actually a, re- a really good guy, and I think he's doing some great stuff for, um, for the sport. There's a few who give you the old death stare, which are quite, quite tricky. Um, I'm trying to think. I like, um, uh, you know, Romain Poit. I think he's very good. Um, and uh, was it Romain who threw me under the bus as well against uh, Italy? When I said to him, he, he kept saying there wasn't a, 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 a ruck. And I said to him, and what you should always ask is like, what do you want to see for it to be a ruck? So I said to him like, well, you know, what, what, what constitutes a ruck in your mind? Like, what picture do you want to see? Everyone's writing to me, oh, mate, you don't even know what a ruck is. <laughs> so I still get that now, as you can imagine. And he said to me, I'm not your coach. And I, was, and I wanted to say back, listen, mate, I'm not the referee, but I could do a better job. But then <laughs> that, again, is not something that you could say. So I had to bite my tongue, and he did me live on TV. So that's, that's come back. So I but I actually like them. I think they're very, very competent. Um, I like George, I think George Lacey, is it George Lacey? Yeah, Lacey, I like Lacey, but he, oh, he's got like the most evil death stare. Like he just goes, I'm like, why are you like, why are you staring at me? If you want to fight me, like you're actually quite a nice guy. But so, so I like them. There's not anyone that I'm like particular. I don't mind. Re- referees for me are there to facilitate. You know, I think they're, they're not there to, uh, you know, if they're there to, to take front centre stage and they're doing the wrong job, they're there just to make decisions. And it's, a hard, it's a hard job to make, they're, they're only human. You know, as a player, all you ever want is consistency. And it's a bit of a wild west at the moment because they're trying to get these things sorted out. Um, and especially the, um, the video referee, like some of them blokes need to literally go to Specsavers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Take another question. It's a hand in the back. Um, a lot's been made over the last, like, 10 or so years about how big rugby players have been getting, especially in the backs. Obviously, forwards have always been big. Um, do you think in future there's going to be more smaller backs like the Cheslin Colbys and Damian McKenzie's of the world to like counter that? Or do you think backs are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger? I think it's a, it's a really good question. I had some, as I, 
as you imagine, doing a lot of like social media stuff um, around health and fitness, one of the things that people, this bloke wrote to me on my, my Facebook page said, uh, and actually he was quite polite, people aren't normally as polite as this, but basically he was insinuating that I was a complete meathead and that if I spent less time in the gym, I would be better at rugby. But he, he asked the way, going, listen, you know, do you think that your career would be better if you were smaller, if you were more mobile, if you were agile? So normally, I either block these people if they've been rude, or I, you know, sometimes I lose my mind and I just, you know, mock them for having terrible teeth or something else, whatever it might be. But I decided that I was going to reply to this guy properly and actually explain to him, educate him for, for the benefit of everyone else. And actually, f for me, you know, my, I, I spend one day, one hour a week in the gym. That's it, I don't do anything else, I don't do any bodybuilding weights, I don't do anything else, I look after my diet, but all my stuff's around mobility and, and power. And I think, you know, over here, you know, with the question we're talking about New Zealand, there is that encouragement to be bigger. You know, I think as a, as a, as a, as a country, uh, you know, we have a lot of men who want to get in shape now, want to be bigger. You know, we've got bigger X here, you know, everyone wants to be kind of, you know, kind of bigger and everyone's working out and training now. And the question I get most asked by young players, young people is, mate, how do I bulk up? I'm not, you know, I keep dropping off tackles. I'm, you know, not big enough. And I always say to them, look, it's not about that, it's your technique. It doesn't matter how big you are, you know, if you can't tackle, you can't tackle. If you don't want to tackle, you, you won't be able to tackle. It doesn't, you know. Um, and I actually think that at some point there's going to be a, a tipping point where mobility is going to come into play uh, that, you know, the, the backs and stuff will even themselves out because now the backs are the same size as the forwards. You know, we've got a guy playing for us, big T's, like 130 kg's on the wing. Like he's bigger than all the forwards. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, when you look at it, all the back, you know, before everyone used to do the same training program, which is wrong because the, the forwards need to do different stuff in the backs. And then they used to have separate workouts. Now the backs are as big as the forwards. They're all doing the same stuff again because they, they need to do that. And I think, I think it will change. I think rugby is still an inclusive game. And I think that a lot of maybe talented players get overlooked for size. You know, they might, they might be a better player, but if someone looks bigger or are perceived bigger, the people select him, you know, more often not would go for the bigger player. But I think that will change because there's got to be a, um, there's got to be a tipping point. But while the game is all about the game line, you know, Everybody talks about the golden era of rugby. Like, if you've ever watched any of those old games, I'm not like detracting from them, but you've got 14 players running around like a herd that you could throw a blanket over and they just run from one side to the other, like tackling's like, optional. They like flop on the side and, a, and a, if you just, a number 10 just dummies, 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 dummies and scores in the corner and everyone falls for it. It's like, come on. You know, now you've got 14 players on your feet. There's no space. Everyone's massive. And if you don't get any momentum, you're stuffed. So while that is the nature of the game, size is important. Uh, but I think like likes of Damien McKenzie and else that, when you get those unique players who um, kind of almost offset that size and add something else, I think there'll always be a place for them because they can do stuff that others can't. And if you've got incredible feet, like Jason Robinson had, it doesn't matter how big you are. If, you, if you're you know, running at people in space, and you turn them inside out. That's why Christian Wade's so good because you can do that. But I, I hope there's a tipping point because again, I, you know, I spend no time in the gym. My whole week is all around the mobility, is, is doing extra passing, extra tackling, all the core skills, is doing the normal training that we have to do. And we train, you know, train Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday, play Saturday, Sunday off, go around again. You know, you've got three meetings a day, you've got separate forward stuff. It's a full on, it's a full on schedule. So. You know, a lot of players aren't, you know, spending all that time in the, in, in the gym like they did. You know, I, I was locked in the gym for the first six months of my career with Wasps because they wanted me really big, me and Tom Reese really big, because uh, they wanted us to be big and fit because they wanted to play a really physical defence, a really aggressive ball-carrying game and have us fit. And we had the motto, get big or die trying. And that was, the, that was, that was what all we did. And it, it was great because it gave me, a, uh, you know, a good physique for now. But I don't spend any time doing it. And I say to young, any young players, don't worry about being massive worry about the core skills of the game, worry about actually being good at rugby, because being massive doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help you. And I, hopefully that is slowly sinking in. But while junior coaches and people think it's important to be big, then you're going to keep getting big players, I think. Let's take another question. Uh, slightly in the same vein, what do you think about Eddie Jones's comments this week about potentially Jack Noel playing in the back row or fielding nine forwards? Yeah, I, so I, I do this uh, podcast called House of Rugby, where, where I try my best never to talk about rugby on it. Um, 
because obviously there's loads of like nausea podcasts out there that like you know really kind of get into it. Um, and they're going to ask me about that tomorrow, and I don't understand it. Like it's not like I don't, I don't understand what Eddie's talking about. Like I love Eddie. Like he just says whatever he wants to say all the time, and it's mainly like he's got everyone running around like blue ass flies, like you know talking about it while they're quietly preparing in in Portugal. I wouldn't say it wasn't a plot, but what's he actually said? He said I want to fill nine forwards. Well, so there was there was two, there was two comments. There was potential to play Jack Noll at seven, right? And then he referred to a time where he was Japan coach and played nine forward. He played a number eight on the wing, I think. Uh, and he said that the game has to adapt to, to, to that kind of stuff. I think it's magic. I think it's Eddie magic. I think it's like, look at what I'm doing with one hand while I'm doing something else with the other. I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, Eddie would do whatever he wanted to do to win the game. You know, that's the beauty of him. He's always looking to develop. Um, I mean, you wouldn't want to put me on the wing. Um, I think if you've got players that, 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 could, that can do that with unbelievable skill sets, then it's... It, I do actually agree in part with what he's saying because a team is all about balance. You've got to get your head out of the fact that it's about uh, you know people being um, really specific for their jobs. Like if you need to play a certain type of opposition and you need more ball, you know ball carriers than anything else, and you want to replace your winger that you know is probably not going to get the ball very often because it's wet weather, it's going to be tight, and you replace him with the forward. That could work, you know. If your wing, you know, if your wing is unbelievably dangerous, and you've just got Marimi to compete for the ball and then bounce around the breakdown, I think it's quite a good idea. That's why every time I get annoyed around back row and back breakdown stuff, when people, you know, that's where all that six and a half stuff came about, because everyone in this country thinks a seven's got to be like five foot four and you know spend a whole life going, whole life going after the ball or flying off the back of the line at a you know, like a, like a, like they used to do back in the day, like Peter Winterbottom. Well. You know, the last time I saw anyone ever hit a 10 was um, Sir Serge Betson on, on Johnny Wilkinson. You know, the, now they're standing so far back, you know, that there's so many ploys, you've got to be involved in the line out. It's not like it was. And I think balance is the most important thing, especially in the back row. You can't have, you know, like you couldn't have three Chris Robshaws because, you know, he's, inc he's an incredibly hardworking guy, but you need a Billy offsets a, a, a Robert, you know, a Tom Curry adds that, you know, a Sam Underhill adds that destructive ability in the breakdown thing, but, but different from the, the carrying. It, it's about finding the right guys to do the right job to play that game. And I think essentially what Eddie's saying, A, after a bit of a smoke screen, is, 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 is probably picking the right players for, for a balance and putting people in the shirt that are going to aid the team. And it doesn't matter what number you've got on your back, because it doesn't now. You know, some of the biggest jacklers on the ball are your centres and your front row. You know, some of your, you know, some of your, 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 your biggest ball carriers are, are, you know, your wingers now. You know what I mean? It, it, it varies. And I think picking players to perform and not sticking to the mould is quite, quite a good idea, actually. But. It's very diplomatic of you. No, no I, I, it, that, it's my genuine, it's like my genuine view. Like, I don't mind, um, you know, disagreeing with that. It's probably not a great career move. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think, I understand what he's trying to say, actually. But I just think it's, it's amazing in the rugby world, because when you're in rugby, you think it's like everything. But you realise when you step out of it in the real world, no one cares about rugby. It's still a small, it's a small sport. But while you're in it, if you pull a pin out of a grenade like that and throw it in, it's absolute normal city. You've got people like, and sports fans are like, are mad people. Like they literally live and breathe it. And that's why I love playing sport and why the fans are so good, but also equally so kind of keen about it, is that they always think their team should win, right? They should always win. It's like, well, hold on a minute. There wouldn't be a betting industry. There wouldn't be anything if your team was always guaranteed to win. And you remember, you're essentially watching grown men chase a ball or a woman chase a ball around a field. Like, can everyone just relax a little bit? But in the rugby world, Eddie says something like that, and they all scramble because all the journalists want to put the knife in. All the fans have got an opinion. And it used to be great because you used to just sit with your mates in a pub and say it. Now you're like, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell James Haskell what I think of him. It's like, mm. <laughs> you know. And the problem is, is that. You, you, you see what's happening in the world at large, what, what people send around now, what people are filming. There is just no limits to what people are doing. You know, anyone can set up a po podcast these days. Like, there's a few podcasts out there that are just so toxic that it's, it's, it's amazing that they still operate, but you know, each their own. And that's why you've got to kind of have a bulletproof demeanor, I think. So let's take, I think, two more, two more questions. Yeah, it's the hand here. <coughs> Well, he's taking his jacket off. <laughs> We're having a fight or something. <laughs> You've kind of hinted on it quite a lot this evening, but do you find with the increase in technology and connectivity around the world, you find it harder just to be you, step out of that public sphere and have the kind of slightly more private life? Or is that not something that you're interested in? 
No, it's not. I think it's a great question. I, I, it's not something I'm worried about because I tell you why, and this is this is genuinely my view on, on on social media, is that it's an incredible tool for sharing information and for uh, business and for um, spreading positivity. The flip side of that is it has brought the worst out in humans and has caused uh, people who would ordinarily be shouting at the, you know, their cat or their wall or, or, or you know, going mad or commenting on the Daily Mail online section because that's where people's souls go to die there. Those, those, people on that, those people on that internet, they literally think that what they're writing, people are taking note and they actually care. But it's just, it's just you know, 250, I'm going to say it, like real life losers just arguing amongst themselves. And the thing is that I, 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 I'm a bit obsessed with Jack the Ripper. Not that I want to kill people, but I, 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 was, read, I was reading a book, a book about him. And actually, when Jack the Ripper, Ripper was around, the Metropolitan Police were getting a thousand letters a week claiming that they were Jack, people were Jack the Ripper. Like, so I'm writing to them going, oh, no, I'm, you know, James Hassel, I'm a murderer. I'm, and they were getting people claiming it all the time. And they get it all the time. But that was, that was however many years ago. People are now, you know, that kind of weird behaviour has followed into, into social media. And now people are doing that to each other and insulting each other. And I think we've got a whole new crop of, of insecurity, of mental health issues, of people like, you know, group suicide, whatever it is. We've all, put, we've all connected now. We're all sharing our inner thoughts where, you know, I argue with my wife all the time. Everyone's entitled to opinion, right? But we all know that some opinions are not worth ever listening to. Just look at history. Hitler had some opinions. Like, do you know, do, you, do we really think he should, he should have just been shouting at his own, you know, his own reflection? And I think with, with social media, I put myself out there. So I take the responsibility. Like, I have no problem but with that. The problem is that once you open Pandora's box to that, you invite these nutters in. And normally, um, you know, they were people that would be screaming to themselves. Now, it's almost like I'm coming up to that window and shouting at the window. And if you, you know, you wouldn't open your front door to let these people in. So you've got to remember that you're keeping them at arm's length. And I just think that I put myself out there so I don't have a problem with it. But if you were genuinely just, and I do it because it's business. I do it because I want to give people insight, because I want to do presenting, because I want, I've got business, I've got products to sell. I want to keep up a, that kind of interest of element because I want to expand into that kind of thing when I finished. But if you're just literally taking pictures of what you ate on your plate, sharing your nights out with people, and it's, I just wouldn't do it. Like, what is the point? That you don't need these random people. You don't need affirmation for people. Like I do it because it's business. Like, someone liking your stuff gives you no value because what happens when the computer switches off and you're sitting in the dark and you're staring at the ceiling and you're like, where are all these people that, you know, you've got to work on yourself all the time. And, and I think that social media is great and I think it's great for interaction, but if you don't have a business, you don't have any reason for doing it, you aren't interested in a specific, specific topic, get off it and stop letting these nutters anywhere near it and stop judging your lives on it because that's you know it's just pointless for me and I don't struggle with it I like it I find that I would never go onto someone's page and insult someone I would never go onto your thing I've never met you before you could post the most insane thing about anything I just wouldn't take it out of my day to go onto it and judge you I might say oh my god do you see this bloke but I wouldn't write to you and say it because that's a different level and it's the same way I don't understand like on the daily why you write on it and insult people why do you comment? It's like, it's like, what's going on? It's because they want other people to look at it because they feel valued, because they feel like they're sharing something, because their lives are so sad. That, that, that's why they're doing it. So I think, it, I think it's a great tool, but shouldn't believe anything you see on it. No one ever posts a bad photo. What you see on it is not, it's not, it's not real life. And unless you're doing a business, unless you're doing stuff, I just wouldn't bother. Because it's, it's going to go one way, and I think it's, it's causing so many people problems. But I, I try to do it and be really honest. Like I tried to say I'm having a good day, I'm having a bad day, this is what happens. I tried to, I like The Rock, for example, because he swears and does, you know, does stuff. And, and you know, that's in America, where everyone's like, you know, don't swear a man, super, you know, with people who are super religious. Well, I like it. He's like, F this and F that. I'm at Oxford, so I won't drop the F bomb, but <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I kind of I like that. So I don't have a problem with that. I, I have a problem with people being ir irrationally nasty. Like what I told you upstairs about that, a car video, people taking their time to write me an essay. Somebody threatening to come and like break my legs if I part like that. And if I, and, and what I'd normally do is I screenshot what these like terrible people say and I put it on my Facebook and I say, listen, le life lesson today, be less like this guy. 
and he got and obviously and then other people then jump on it and then send him messages and everything else and he was like writing to me going my, my wife and I are getting insulted now I can't believe you did that I was like mate you said you were gonna burn my house down and break my legs <laughs> but I don't write that I just leave it and then, and then he starts like contacting him on every platform and then he, and he honestly said his, his exact words were your career is based around your ability to play I would hate something to happen to you I'm like do you know what I mean? And that's over a, car, a funny car video. Like an American guy the other day, which is like, looked like he's had his you know, head on backwards, was said to me the other day, you know, you need to learn how to park you. And it's like, can everyone just calm down? So by all means, share a bit of love, but don't share that. It's just not, not great. And I'll take one final question. Sorry, that was a bit ranty, but I get a bit passionate <laughs> about that. Any final question? Hand down there. Uh, how do you fancy England's chances for the World Cup? Um, I think they're good. You know, I think of all, the, of all the England teams I've ever been involved with, I think they've got the best possible chance. I think that people forget that actually when you go into a World Cup, everyone becomes so obsessed with um, you know, what happens beforehand. The most important thing about winning games beforehand is knowing that as a team, you can beat that opposition knowing that you can win games in tight situations because when you're out there on the field, if you don't have anything to draw on, it's a new experience. But, you know, this England side under Eddie's gone to Australia, won 3-0, you know, won two Six Nations, won a Grand Slam, you know, pushed, beaten every Southern Hemisphere side, I think, except, except New Zealand, but, you know, getting to losing to one point, that would have been a massive learning curve for them, understanding that, you know, for example, the line-out, putting pressure on it, how would they would deal with it, how would they stop someone like Retallick winning the ball, how important those turnovers are. But also going to a World Cup is so different. You're going to Japan, you're away from your friends and family. Uh, it's a super intense, high-pressure environment. Some teams and some people survive in that, some people don't. And you know, Eddie's been very vocal about picking people who can deal with that over po people who may be better players because you, you, know, you take someone over there and they crumble or they don't get picked and then they're kicking stones the whole time and bringing everyone else down. That, that, you know, all those kind of elements go into what's important about a World Cup. And I think you know, we as, as, as you know, England fans get very, very passionate. Um, I remember in 2015, you know, obviously when the wheels came off after that, everyone was going like mental, like all the press went mental. You know, they built the team up and then they absolutely battered everyone. You know, and, and people like Chris Robshaw took like terrible um, uh, you know, kind of media stuff when he didn't deserve it. You know, he, he was one of the hardest working, best guys. You know, he, you know, for me, he, he, he did everything he could do. And I think that uh, it's important just to, you know, to, rem to remember that it's a very different thing, kind of World Cup rugby. And I think that we've got as good a chance as anyone. I think obviously New Zealand are the team to beat. I think Ireland are the team to beat in the Six Nations. But I would never rule out England. I think um, Eddie is a, is a master tactician. He's got a great coaching staff, got incredible players around, around him. And I think that if they can stay together, stay fit, and deliver the performances they want, they'll definitely be mentally prepared to, to, to do it. So I would always back England and, and hopefully I'll be part of it. Otherwise I'll be like a full tourist, like running like some sort of Gulliver's Travels or something on the, on the thing. Right, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to join with me in thanking James Haskell.